Definitely. Okay. I'm so proud to be before you today as a co-founder and woman in charge of Black Californians United for Early Care and Education. That is my real title on the IRS documents. Um, <laughs> have you all heard of Dr. Robin D'Angelo? She wrote White Fragility. So um, she, one of our, so the good thing about Black UC, we're multi-generational. I'm a Gen X, but we've got a Gen Z on the staff. And he sent me a video of her, not knowing that it was totally relevant to today. He just sent it on Sunday. And in it, she says, Pretty much all of us have been taught by white people who've 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 been taught by white people using textbooks written for and about white people. You pretty much only had white teachers, so if you're, if you're white, you were relentlessly reflected at the front of the room. If you're a person of color, rarely, if ever, did you see yourself reflected at the front of the room. So people here of the global majority, does that resonate with you? Yeah? This doesn't have to be quiet. OK. <laughs> White folks, does that resonate with you? Did you see yourself always up at the front of the room? I was born and raised in Hanford, California. Went, uh, yay, did someone come to Central Valley? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Go pull pups. Um, went to UC Berkeley and then San Francisco State. Go Bears. Yeah. Go. Gators, Gators, I think, yeah. Gators. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Nana, my grandmother, was my first black educator outside of my mother. Nana had a family child care home. I checked with my oldest friend, Katie, last night, who was also cared for by Nana, and confirmed that Nana was her only black, child, black educator all the way through college, and Katie is white. I had a black teacher in the third grade, another in college, and one last one in graduate school. I was born, I'm not yet 50, but 50 years ago this year. My daughter, on the other hand, turns 16 next month. She is in the 10th grade. Nini, a family child care educator, has thus far been her only black educator, and there are no black educators at, currently at her high school. With Nini, my daughter heard the comforting sound of black English smelled and ate the deliciousness that is Nini's 7-Up cake and red velvet cake. With Nini, she came home with skillfully braided hair, helping her appreciate the beauty and magic of her nappy hair from the start. Nini also cared for white children and are who are st statistically unlikely to have experienced learning from any other black educator, just like my oldest friend, Katie. Whiteness is the default in education at every level, and we are harming all children by upholding systems that only affirm whiteness. Whiteness is the default everywhere, and we are literally dying because of it. To my fellow people of the global majority, if you're like me, you don't always realize the mask you're wearing daily or the heaviness of navigating white dominant culture until you get to be Im immersed within your own. It's daunting, and we're doing this to our children from birth, but not all of us. Martha Hernandez, on the, oh, I can't see you on the end, Martha, <laughs> there you are. Martha is the executive director of Californians Together. She heads a coalition of advocating for California's 1.1 English learners. With 42 years of California's public, in California's public education, she served as assistant superintendent, county director, administrator, and teacher. Martha focuses on expanding biliteracy programs, implementing the California English Learner Roadmap, and leading the National Committee for Effective Literacy to Enhance Literacy for Emerging Bilingual and English Learner Students. Chris Chapman, next to Terry, is the CEO and founder of Kingmakers of Oakland, a national award-winning nonprofit that improves educational and life outcomes for black boys. Recognized as a leader in education reform, Chapman is dedicated to uplifting the African American community. He is the founding executive director of African American Male Achievement at Oakland Unified School District and a recipient of numerous awards, including the Oscar Wright Lifetime Achievement Award. And then Ben Wong is an American born Chinese from San Francisco with 30 plus years of nonprofit experience. He has worked in direct service with local community children and youth programs as project and program management, executive leadership, and board management. <coughs> he 
He has previously served on the Delinquency Prevention Commission, Juvenile Justice Commission. My daughter helped me read this last night, and she just finished a show called Juven a K-drama called Juvenile Justice. Does anybody watch K-dramas? <laughs> and that was her note on your bio. <laughs> Good note. Uh, and other boards of directors. He is currently appointed on San Francisco's Child Care Planning and Advisory Council and San Francisco Planning Department's Equity Council. Mm. Ben possesses a bachelor's degree in business and master's in counseling, marriage and family therapy, and has an interest in education, child development, and juvenile justice. So let's welcome our panel. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm mic'd up. <laughs> it's like uh, NF ESPN, NFL. Okay, <laughs> it won't be as juicy. Um, so I'm gonna start with my questions, which, there we go. I'm not gonna call on you, you're just gonna speak when you're moved. Um, what does a healthy learning environment that affirms children or students' full identities look like in the communities that you serve? I guess I can start. Um, I really am going to highlight five districts that have been identified as bright spots in the implementation of the EL roadmap. And so when the English Learner Roadmap was adopted, it was a significant shift from previous policies that were really deficit-oriented and English-only policies. And um, it shifted to embrace a policy that is aspirational, comprehensive, and um, evidence-based, mm -hmm. research-based. Mm -hmm. And um, this policy, of course, celebrates um, the linguistic and cultural assets of students and families. And so um, this, um, I guess, journey, just to kind of back up a little bit, that the legislature um, funded um, educator workforce um, incentive grants in order to invest in the implementation of the roadmap. And so Californians Together was awarded one of these grants for the EL RISE partnership. And the EL RISE partnership, of course, um, our partners were SEAL, the Sobrato Early Academic Language, and SEAL with a C, the Center for Equity for English Learners at Loyola Marymount University. In this partnership, um, we provided professional learning and technical assistance over 20 county offices of education. And um, as such, um, afterwards, um, we um, wrote um, three reports, and really they were all written by Dr. Lori Olson. And she um, captured um, the findings and recommendations for the implementation of the English Learner Roadmap. And so why that is important in terms of um, assets-based, um, needs-responsive school environments is that that is what the uh, policy is. It's the English Learner Policy for California, and it really has four buckets. And one of them is knowing your students, knowing your diverse um, students in your classroom. Second, it's creating uh, inclusive environments that uplift the language and um, the culture of, of students. Ensuring that uh, campuses are welcoming, affirming, and safe, and as well as building strong uh, family community partnerships. And so these five districts, which I'll talk about later, really exemplified uh, the creation of assets-based needs responsive schools because we all know that children learn best when they feel safe, when they feel welcomed, and when they feel affirmed. So. I was gonna, uh, so, so I think for us at WAME, we work in the Chinese American community. I think it starts with the first interaction that we might have with a parent. Because ensuring that the parent feels like there is a safe environment for their child is one of those most critical parts, I think, for us as we look at sort of the child development side of this. The other pieces, I think, are um, teachers who look like them, speak the language, and in our case, it's English, Cantonese, and Mandarin, um, uh, but also like uh, the details around the signage. And so we have chairs that are marked in, ch in English chairs, but also in Chinese, right? So it's this idea that they're exposed to the language and culture 
uh, universally. Uh, the way we actually do our program actually is that a Cantonese speaker would speak to the child in Cantonese, would ask the, uh, the, person, the, the child to speak, to respond in Cantonese. And so they're learning and being exposed to the language and the culture. So, so the other pieces I think are, uh, it is affirming I think the cultural aspects that they may see at home mm -hmm. that's aligned. So everything in terms of the food, uh, the way we might greet each other uh, every morning, uh, goodbyes in, in, in the evening, um, I, I think those are the kinds of, uh, the, the details I think are the things that matter on term, around the language and culture. Yeah, with Kingmakers of Oakland, uh, we center black boys while serving all students. Um, and we have uh, really, we use this frame of healing the fish while treating the toxic ecosystem. Um, we realize that the public school system was never designed to engage, encourage, and empower black, brown, indigenous, and API youth. With that being said, as we have a set of strategies using liberatory design to work with a multiracial, intergenerational, cross-sectional team to redesign that school system, as a father of three black boys, I don't have the time uh, right, uh, to, that it takes to dismantle systems of oppression and reimagine liberatory systems that are gonna center those furthest from opportunity. But that's part of our work. How do we center black boys? Uh, we do that in kind of six domains. Um, and this work was actually codified. One of my, uh, the brother before us talked about Tom Dees. Tom Dees is an economist, a researcher out of Stanford University, did a 10-year longitudinal study, if you want to read on our work, uh, while I was the executive director of Oakland Unified School District and the deputy chief uh, of equity uh, from the 2010 to 2020. He codified the work that we're doing. With that being said, um, the things that inoculate black boys, one, um, the heaviest lift in this system is the adult mindsets. And so we work with adults to understand the beauty, brilliance, and innate greatness of every black boy uh, that they're blessed to have in their presence. That is a heavy lift, y'all. Um, one of the things that we do when we come into a school community is start with the kings. And that's why I really appreciated my young sister um, uh, that was speaking earlier um, in Temecula. Brooklyn, Brooklyn mm -hmm. yeah, and I'll shout out to her mom. Uh, uh, yeah, but all that to be to say, uh, all that to be said is that um, if you really want to accelerate educational life outcomes for those children furthest uh, from opportunity, is listen to them. And they will tell you exactly what you need to, to do to engage, encourage, and empower them. And so one of the things that we do when we come into a classroom or a school environment is just listen to young people. And what, uh, what they are sharing is typically black boys are coming into schools where adults aren't seeing them or engaging them. Or when they do, um, they and see them or engage them as if they've done something wrong or they've done something bad. The other thing that uh, our young people are telling us is they need access to more black teachers. We know that a black male teacher not only has a significant impact on the child, on, on black children, but all children. With that being said, um, some of the conditions that we set uh, within the classroom concept, uh, construct is uh, recruiting, training, and retaining black male teachers. So that's paramount. Children are who they see, they are what we say, uh, we are, they are what they hear, and it's very important uh, that we all work hard to accelerate uh, opportunities for black men uh, to move from just being classified staff, and nothing wrong with being a classified staff, or our athletic coaches, but disproportionately we represent in that domain and we're not being represented in the classroom. So having a black male teacher. Two, culturally responsive curriculum and pedagogy. The story I'll tell on this is I was a teacher actually in San Francisco at Thurgood Marshall Academic High School. It was supposed to be the black, brown, indigenous uh, version of Lowell, all that to say. I had 99% students of color. I was teaching modern world history. In my first day of class, I asked all 140 students to write down the top 10 most influential people in history and her story. This is kindergarten through 10th grade. And in all of my classes, uh, when all those students uh, did their partner pair shares, came up in, uh, uh, in, in groups of five, and then wrote down their top 10 list, um, it was 49 white men and one person of color. So the first time I got written up was at the end of my first period modern world history class, I took our modern world history books and we threw them out the window. Um, Dr. Butcher came out, uh, ripped me up, or actually he warned me then. Um, I didn't throw books out the window, I didn't have him throw the books out the window then, but we had them uh, throw them in the garbage can. All that to say, um, this school system 
does a very good job in codifying and celebrating the accomplishments of Eurocentricity and our white brothers and sisters. That's all love. But you are, if you are of color, even though we may, and we still excel in this system, we know not who we are. So it's paramount in math, science, language arts, social studies, and all the elective classes in this country, we have to rewrite curriculum standards to lift up the cultural prosperity and genius uh, that has been codified throughout the diaspora in those domains from pre-K through PhD. So we, the other domain in creating an affirming, liberatory environment is making sure that you have African-centered, indigenous API um, uh, content. So that's a cultural responsive curriculum. I'll go through the, the other four areas real, quick, real fast. The third area is youth voice and leadership. Um, what I find throughout school districts in this country is that we cream. The only folks that have access to student leadership councils, all city councils, uh, student boards, are those young kings or queens or young people that actually are thriving with 3.5 GPAs and above. Um, while I was the executive director of AMA within the district, I was blessed to take students to DC and meet President Barack Obama, not once, but twice, and I did not cream. The majority of my students, uh, really the only uh, determining factor for them to be on this council to travel the country was will. And out of that, um, these kings now are doing amazing things. So youth, youth voice and youth leadership. The other domain is family community engagement. Uh, typically, if you're a black uh, parent in this country, you were traumatized in this school system, and then that traumatized is relived when your children are going through these systems. But we need to see and work with families and parents as assets, not deficits. The fourth domain um, is around narrative. Public school systems do two things very well when it comes to narrative change. Crisis communication and reactionary communication. We do not know how to do asset-based communication that reflects the beauty, brilliance, and innate greatness of uh, black children in particular um, and their families and communities. And in closing, what binds all this goodness is policy. Typically, we start with policy, which is wrong, because we have so many good policies that no one has a clue about, and culture eats policy for breakfast. And you can have the most dynamic, brilliant people come into the classroom uh, or run a school, uh, but the policy and the culture of the district just really stifles their spirit. So those are the six areas of which that create a, a thriving environment for our young kings, pre-K through PhD. Thank you. Um, Ter Terry, I'm going to ask you that same question and add on. But I want to say how I love that you all are speaking my language. I love the asset-based framing. Um, Chris, you said something. I don't remember what you said, but it reminded me of one of our tenants at Black ECE. We believe that our presence is a blessing to others. Bless and you. you said that. You said something like that in, in relation to how um, the work that you do with Black boys and Ben, like parents, like connecting with parents, because I feel like our system so often and especially in, well, in early education and K through 12, to have absolutely no respect for the expertise of parents and families and their home life. So I really appreciated hearing that. And so then Terry, I want the, still the same question is what is a healthy learning environment affirming um, children look like for you? But also if you can add on how and if you work, collaborate with other parts of the birth through 12 system um, to achieve what you're doing. I'm, I'm guessing we just we just met, but it doesn't go far enough to go K, <laughs> birth to, to 12. Well, birth to... to I, I mean, until. we all got 20 and 30-year-olds. We're trying to right. figure out how to support <laughs> and keep right. going. That's and right. to keep going. Um, for 15... I'm a member of the, the Kuduk tribe. I'm a member and citizen of the Kuduk tribe. Um, that's the language I was committed to learning. And for 15 years, I taught the Kuduk language one day a week in the Klamath Trinity Joint Unified School District, I specialized in K through eight. Um, we went to a school board meeting um, because we didn't, uh, even, even though more than half of the schools in, uh, on the Klamath River uh, have a student population that's Native American, we didn't have Native American language languages taught on a regular basis in the schools. Oh my God, language is so controversial. Mm -hmm. And the young woman that was on the panel before lunch said to be persistent. That is the only way to get anything done. Persistent, mostly with a smile, sometimes not, but you gotta keep doing it. And the school board 
meeting, I just remember it was just so significant that we were asking, we were asking the school board to pull funds out of their general fund to support native language teachers. And that night at the school board meeting, there were 17 tires slashed in the parking lot. Mm. And the thing was, we didn't necessarily know which, which population did it. White people didn't like the idea of native language being taught in the schools because it was a pullout program at that time. You, you, they were, native Americans would be pulled out to be taught their language and, and white people thought their kids were getting left behind. There, there was an enrichment that they were missing out on. Native American parents thought their kids were getting left behind because they were getting ma missing out on math and science. So we evolved that to not only ask for funds from the school district's general fund, but for time in the classroom with the teacher doing the classroom management while we are teaching the language for everyone, everyone that was, that was there. And I, a quick story about creating the environment for uh, self-confidence and self-esteem and promoting that in all young people, no matter white, black, brown, or whatever. There was a young Native American that transferred into our, into our um, school and in the first few weeks just loved learning the Native language, the Native language that I was teaching him. And then he quit participating. He just, he just shut down and, and I talked to him at, at, at break and I was like, so you really liked this a few weeks ago, but now you're not, our, we didn't have any textbooks. It was all immersion. It was using communication-based instruction, CBI, five-step lesson plan in the classroom. It's, it's immediate, it's immersion, it's right there. We're playing a lot. Well, why, why, aren't, why aren't you doing this anymore? And he said, because it's a different tribe. I'm a different tribe mm. than you, and I don't want to not learn my language someday. And I said, you know, brother, that is really a great answer. I'm so glad you're honest with me, mm. but that's not how our brain works. It really is not how our brain works. Our brain needs as much of that exercise, French, Russian, German, Chinese, it doesn't matter. My second oldest grandson who is graduating from high school this year, when he was in preschool, he was in Chinatown at a China, Chinese immersion school. I told my daughter, that's great. I told this young Native American male, I said, what you learn now, you, you're, you, you're developing those brain cells to learn your language when you want to later. Mm -hmm. And he came back into it. That's great. Thank that's you. Great. <laughs> um, <laughs> So Ben, how do you how do you work across birth through twelve systems? Uh, I think my first response is with the challenge. Mm -hmm. um, the very idea that uh, so Wame actually started fifty years ago after the Lao versus Nichols Supreme Court ruling that allowed for dual language education. Mm -hmm. In short, it was a Chinese family who said, "If you're not teaching my kid in the language they understand, you're not teaching my kid." Mm -hmm. And so from, from that really is the idea of how do we support uh, and fully embrace the language and culture. Then you get into a system that doesn't do that. And so while we try to work with the system, we're actually also trying to really challenge the system. So we're fortunate enough to actually have our own site that does ECE or the care and education work. We also do after school programs, again, dual language, tri trilingually. Uh, the school in San Francisco is one of the first uh, Chinese American, Chinese English uh, immersion school in San Francisco. Um, and we do their after school program. But it's a system, uh, it's a school district and a system that doesn't support, I think, the, the language and, and culture that it needs to be on the school hour. So we are trying to bring the kinds of things that we believe in terms of the enrichments and the kinds of things that we know that children need in the after school hour at the same time coming up with conflicts about sort of what works and what doesn't work within a school site. So mm -hmm. the short answer is we work with them and sometimes we fight against them. And so that's the best way to, I think to think about how we think about our, the, the working with the systems. Well, you think that, you know, there's people like, to burn it down, we have, some <laughs> of us have to be like work within the system yeah. to help us who are working outside the same system and together 
we can create the new th yeah. that may take for uh, just you were saying Chris it takes just as long to unbuild as it took to build which sucks but <laughs> If we have yeah. everybody working on the inside and outside together. And I was going to say, I think over time we're seeing more individuals of people of color who actually are starting to understand and see, but it's the system itself that I think is the biggest challenge. And so how do right. like even working to your point, both inside and outside the system to actually transform that, mm -hmm. so. Martha. So I'm going to go back to the Yale roadmap um, and principle four talks and emphasizes about articulation and alignment which means really a well-coordinated set of practices and policies across grade levels and educational segments. And so we know um, that um, strong communication between educators, you know, in terms of early learning, those educators should be communicating with, you know, the kindergarten and the elementary school. The elementary school, of course, needs strong communication with the middle school, and it goes on and on and on. And so um, we know that, you know, entrance into an early, um, you know, learning environment and then enrollment into TK or K and then transition into elementary, transition into middle school, those are vulnerable points where we can lose, you know, our multilingual learners or all students. Mm -hmm. And so the system you know, needs to be very intentional, intentional about efforts to smooth those leaps and create, you know, systems where, um, you know, students don't fall between the cracks. And so also we need to inform parents uh, and families about the different expectations between the different levels. And then we need to provide parents also with information information about biliteracy programs and pathways for their students. And I think that um, in terms of our five um, districts um, that we call bright spots, they were very mindful about um, a couple of things. And one of those things was the need for a consistent language development program, right? So that we have something from early learning all the way through 12th grade and beyond. Also, it's really important in terms of consistency of home language support. And so, um, you know, we need to be able to support students in nurturing their home language. And sometimes we have this like ping pong, you know, a student could be in a early learning situation where their language is uplifted and then end up in a kindergarten program or a TK program that's English only. And then maybe they go into a dual language immersion program, um, and that's a problem. Or it could be reverse, where they are in a early learning program that's only in English and then enter into a dual language. Of course, it's always best to enter into a biliteracy program because um, English learners do best when they're enrolled in these programs. They do best at learning English over time. They do best in terms of their academic progress and outcomes. They do best in maintaining their home language, their identity, and who they are. And so articulation is very, very important. Also, I think it's really important that um, data sharing needs to be consistent. You know, we need to make sure that we have data sharing systems between all of these educational segments as well as consistent terminology uh, because um, otherwise, um, you know, our students, um, you know, will, will suffer. And um, we talked about affirming environments and sometimes I think when we think about affirming environments, we may think about early learning or we think about kindergarten, but we need to ensure this bicultural, um, you know, identity development is throughout. And we need affirming environments in middle school and affirming environments in high school. And I think, um, you know, well, we really need to work on the system to create, um, you know, articulation and alignment for the benefit of all students, but particularly for English learners, dual language learners, our multilingual learners. Chris, how do you work across systems? How do we work across systems? Uh, we're, so well, or different I'm, parts of the birth as well. Yeah. Ecosystem. Um, how do we work across? I mean, so when spiders unite, they can weave a web that can capture a lion. Um, we cannot do what can we you do. Say that again. When Slower. spiders, and it's an African um, proverb that when spiders unite, they can weave a web that can capture a lion. 
to the degree of which in this country of individualism, capitalistic values of which um, the pri it privileges the privilege, right? And it puts us all together, uh, or, excuse me, puts us all fighting against each other. And so to the degree of which we know um, that we could begin to unite to redesign, well, dismantle and redesign systems, you have to figure out a way to collaborate and partner. And so, um, so let me just say that. I, it's a very complex question. I want to go to language, because the only monolingual Africans uh, in, in, on the planet are African Americans. And I just have to go back to the inception and creation of this country um, of how 300 years of wealth, of system, structure, condition, and culture were made off enslaved people, were uh, pillaged off indigenous folks, um, indigenous uh, Asians and Latino Chicano. Uh, so when you think about that head start um, and the elimination of language is intentional. There are not translations in all of our cultures that you can get it to your culture through English. You have to, we have to understand and speak our native indigenous language. This to me was proven even greater when I was in New Mexico and I was in the Pueblo Nation and I was seeing um, just how intentional the Pueblo Nation, um, how they were creating attorneys in kindergarten to combat uh, United States corporate law to protect the sovereign state of the Pueblo Nation. Why? And they started with their language. So I just say this to say in the spirit of the complexity Having been an entrepreneur all my life, being a K-12 teacher, principal, and systems leader, um, I have done systems work all my life. Now it's out, outside of the system. Um, and, and we need the inside-outside game, but we need to own land, and we need to do that together. We need to c uh, connect uh, globally. Uh, we need to connect the cultures to redesign educational systems that it's like, it's like we did education. I mean, if you think about history be beyond the history of the United States of America, all of our folk, brilliant in math, science, language, arts, and social studies, um, that was usurped and then rewritten and systems and structures were created to prevent us really understanding and manifesting our greatness. So for me, um, I'm gonna agitate and we're gonna help folks within these systems reimagine, but the truest piece is we need to own our land, create new liberatory educational systems, um, economic systems, healthcare systems. So I'm not fighting for something or asking, like we're able from the moment we come out the, actually even before the womb, though we're creating legacy because it's, we're not, we're not um, trying to go against something, we're actually liberating what is within us and that's the 15, generations of uh, ancestral intelligence that our ancestors left within our DNA. In this culture, we can't even tap into that because we don't get it in the pre-K-12 huh, system. We don't get it in the language. We don't get it in television. The system, yeah, so I just say, it, we have to get back to our roots. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, that process of liberation will unlock so much genius, wealth, and abundance. And so, for me, it's it's getting back to that. And so how you do that is through, it is Ubuntu. I am because we are, we are because I am. May the circle be unbroken. Like it is within our values that you build, that families come together, we support each other, versus the present system where you have students from day one competing against each other in a classroom for the best grade, you know, like all this thing, it's, it's off. And so, yeah, I mean, that's how I respond to the, the question. This, by design, the system was never set up for the folks absolutely, that are on this panel. Absolutely not. Yeah. You're, I mean, you are absolutely correct in that. Um, since, before I move on, I'm about to move on to the next question, but I just love that you brought up language among black folks and African American folks, and that our enslaved ancestors came from all over the west coast of Africa, and you know, with all the stops throughout you know, South America, the Caribbean, and then the United States, and in the United States, our enslaved ancestors created a new language based on all other language, which today is black English or African American vernacular English, yes. which is, I would say then, the most disrespected language. It's the language that once we hit school, schools try to teach out of our children and say we don't know how to speak correctly or don't know how to talk. When there's um, entire rules and everything 
And everyone likes to try to talk black English that's not black. Um, and so it's cool then when other people do it. And so that is a priority in black ECE of uplifting black English, especially and affirming black English and culture for our youngest children um, in hopes and preparation that in their early learning environments and once they reach um, elementary school that we aren't trying to teach that out of them. And so that much like the, the, the students who um, are learning languages not rooted in English, that they get that same affirmation and also that same grace as they're learning That's to right. read um, and write in academic English. That's so, right, well said. Yeah. The next question, we, got, we, got, we get lots of time for this one. So I'll go back to Terry. This time I'm gonna, I want you all to tell a story. What is, like, what's been the impact of your program or how have you, this is, how have you partnered with families or ch child care providers, early educators, educators, uh, not early educators, anything? Or don't even listen to that question. Just tell us stories <laughs> about your program <laughs> and what you want us to know. I, I, I want all of us to be more comfortable with race mm. and to be able to talk about it yeah. and say, this is what I am. It was, it was, dec I was, I was a full grown ass adult before I could say, yeah, I'm more fair skinned than some of my cousins and my relatives because I'm half Irish. Mm. I never met that, that dude that was the, the donor, <laughs> but, but I'm half Irish, I'm half Native American. And I could, I was weaker for not being able, for, for hating a side I didn't know and wanting to be something I couldn't be because I couldn't be full-blooded Native American, mm -hmm. like my great aunt and my great uncle who raised me. So I'd love for us to be able to be more comfortable about talking about race. And when you said the question, what I wanted everyone to know about True North Organizing Network is that, that we grew out of our community foundation up in the Redwood region and that foundation, before True North was even created, the foundation brought John Powell from the Haas Institute at Berkeley up to talk to, to one of our little redneck um, counties and communities. And, and you would have thought he was telling everyone to be communist or something. It was just so radical. And I sat there and listened to the man. I was trying to disguise the county because I was not trying to badmouth anybody or in fact, I was just talking to one of those people on the phone this morning, they called me. And, 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 you know, I listened to what John Powell was talking about, belonging. Well, guess what, folks? True North held, held what was that, Evan, a month ago, two months ago? We held a Belong series training for teachers, administrators, students, and parents on let's create some safe spaces for conversations about real things and about who you are and about who I am. And I just love the fact that 10 years ago, that was controversial, and now we're teaching it. Mm -hmm. no, sure. mm -hmm. Martha, do you have a story? What, what should we know? What should you know in <laughs> terms of impact? And so um, I just want to kind of highlight um, that you know, um, the five districts that were uplifted in this publication all had uh, these uh, visionary, um, amazing leaders in the uh, system, either the superintendent or the assistant superintendent. And when the leaders, um, you know, are passionate and they prioritize the implementation of the roadmap, when they prioritize the creation of assets-based, needs-responsive schools, things happen, amazing things happen. The system begins to move. And so each of these districts you know, had this type of a leader. And um, I, you know, it's just, um, you know, we all know that leadership matters, but when it comes to changing the system, you really need to have those key people. Also, we know that um, it took a lot of resources and investments for these um, particular leaders, and so they invested in building capacity of their people on their staff, and they invested, and they invested, and it's a lot of hard work, but they made sure it was all in professional development. 
you know, all of the administrators went through training. All of the teachers went through training. The parents, the school board members, counselors, it was all in. So they were it's talking the same language and they were able to, um, you know, across the system make changes. And there's something that's really important, you know, it's so important for systems to know their students and to have systems where they get to know their students. And so, of course, we know that English learners, dual language learners, multilingual learners are not a monolithic group, right? There are subgroups. And so we have, of course, newcomers. But the newcomers, we have well-educated newcomers. And we have um, students with interrupted formal education. We have students who are unaccompanied minors. We have long-term English learners. English learners who are on an IEP and have special needs. You know, our dual language learners. There's so many different types um, of profiles of an English learner. And so a leader needs to make sure, right, that, that the system, that everyone knows who their students are. And that could be, of course, looking at data, um, walking through classrooms, but also um, engaging families, engaging families because they have knowledge. They have knowledge and skills. They can bring in their culture. They um, know their child. They know their child's needs. So the parent and the families were brought in um, to you know the surface so that the educators could better serve on those students. And so I just kind of want to salute. Um, those leaders who took this on. It's um, the English Learner Roadmap is an aspirational policy. It's not a short-term endeavor. It's a long-term endeavor. It's very comprehensive, but we got to roll up our sleeves and we have to get to work. And these superintendents, and I have to say most of them Latinas, um, you know, who are probably English learners themselves, really are making it happen. And I think we can replicate that also. So those are, I want to tell the story of those amazing leaders. Thank you. Chris or Ben, would you choose? I can jump in. Um, I want to acknowledge half of our board are kings that I met either in elementary or middle school. The kings under the age of 25. Our kings just need a, uh, an opportunity. Um, they manage an $8.1 million organization, a 10,000 square foot facility, and a footprint now that's grown from the domestic United States now to global work. And those are young kings that had, uh, did not have an academic identity when I met them, um, but were given an opportunity. The other thing I just wanted to say is I want to just encourage you all, we got to think about, uh, light, like, uh, in particular for black boys that are under attack in this country, um, you got to, it's not just pre-K-12. Um, you can graduate with a 5.0 GPA, get access to all, and this is the king, Akintunde Ahmad, get, uh, uh, got um, applied to all the Ivies, got into all the Ivies, but even left all that and still knew not knew who he was because he mastered one system, one structure and the conditions and culture, but that didn't necessarily unlock the beauty, brilliance, and innate greatness of who and who he is. Um, and then when, in, uh, when getting his advanced degree um, at another Ivy League institution, uh, and then walking from that institution, and I don't know how many folks are familiar with Yale, kind of you have inside Yale, which is a whole other world, and you have outside Yale, New Haven, um, fit a description, and uh, went through this trauma. And, and so it's like, it is, if you are black in this country, I'm tired of feeling blue. And so it's not a, a black people issue, it's really like white folks, I need y'all to look in the mirror with love and grace. What is your work, what are you all gonna do to redesign this system that centers those furthest from opportunity and of which philanthropy and accumulation of the generational wealth beyond anything in our lifetime, you all are the beneficiaries of. And I say this as a, biologically half Irish and Italian, and, and I too, uh, uh, and African American. I was born in 68, and the moment they knew, the, uh, my mom knew she had me, I, uh, it was not a decision, I was being adopted, but I was adopted by a, a beautiful black man, Herbert Joseph Chapman from New Orleans, and a beautiful um, a black sister named Deloitte Sanchez out of uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, who both re relocated to Oakland. So I just say this to say though, um, it is a multiracial, intergenerational, cross-sector approach. If we want to make this country, 
great. Man, we got so much work to do. We all got our own work to do. So um, I just want to call, that's my charge to action, but I'm just going to lift up the kings on my board. Um, uh, Willie, uh, I'm going to lift up Ricky. I'm going to lift up, um, uh, who's my other board? Uh, George, uh, jo uh, George Henderson, and I'm going to lift up uh, one more king, one more king, Romero Wesson. And invite you all, we're doing our national symposium starting tomorrow at the Marriott Convention Center. Uh, but if you all want to come out in Oakland, check us out. And you can um, catch our vibe as well. But thank you for the opportunity and, and great facilitation. And I'll okay. pass it to uh, Brother Ben. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's a tough act to follow, first of all. Because <laughs> I 100% agree with you. Uh, I think the story of, uh, uh, of both Wame and I think the Asian American experience is that it continues to be evolving. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm an American-born Chinese, but, but really the immigration patterns as we even see from the 60s to today it continues to be burgeoning. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think the story to be told is the important work that we do, I think as we look towards the future, uh, not to get political about this, but China is becoming such a political force in the United mm -hmm. States or in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, we are paying attention to like what that means to the Asian American community. The API hate sort of that's been going on in the last several years is a critical component of our community. Um, we are a strong community, but we are a community that is still continuing to learn, to be honest with you. Uh, we have our own, uh, I think it was mentioned here possibly, that, that, that our, some of our instructors themselves were the immigrants, they just came over recently as EC teachers. There's really great strength in it, but they themselves don't have a lot of background in history about Asians in America or people of color in America, to be honest with you. And so there's a lot of work to be done, I think, within our own community as we fight collectively with our, our entire BIPOC community, right? Like, how do we lead, ensure that everyone is, is affirmed in their own language and culture? So I think the story to be told, I think, for the Asian American community really is it is continuing to be evolving. And I think, to be honest with you, it's going to be a little dicey for the Asians, to be honest with you. It, it, it already is, but I think it's going to get even sort of more challenging. And so one of the things we continue to look at and one of the things I think is so critically important for the work that we do is to invest in the young people here to learn the language and culture so they can be proud because that hate is going to be coming. And so we, we see that, I feel that. And so that's sort of, that sort of the thing that, that we're paying attention to. I think that's the story to be told, I think, for, for, for Wame and the Asian American community. Yeah. Beautiful. What you all said, and thank you so much. Um, <laughs> To whoever's in charge, I'm going to go by this timer, even though I know we're behind. So I'm going to take I'm going to take advantage of the minutes that that, that say that are there. But between all of our community, I want I just wanted to know for the children that you all care about. Um, I'm going off script, so it's <laughs> my question: How do you and how can we, as we're tr creating these liberating? welcoming, affirming environments, <laughs> um, help our children to be so proud of themselves, to not fall in the trap that I mentioned in my opening remarks of, of leading into white dominant culture, because that's for survival, because we have to fit into these systems. And that's such a weight. It's such, it's, it's tiring, it, it's exhausting, it's painful. And how do we help our children now? Because we know better now, like we do, so many of us, especially immigrant families, you're raised to assimilate, um, and even non-immigrant people of color are raised to assimilate as a, as a source of survival. And I want to stop that, because <laughs> we, we are valuable for who we are, and as we are, and our children are. So do you have any thoughts or examples, you see the clock there, that, <laughs> that um, in which you're trying to do that? with the children that you love and care about today? I, ben made me think about it. I don't only want to talk about race, I want to talk about fear. I mm -hmm. want to talk about it with my children, I want to talk about it in the classroom, I want to talk about it in my communities, because it seems like we can be our own worst enemies when we not only look for other people to look like us, that we can band together and try to figure things out, then we're also we're not dealing with our fears, we're not moving, we're not building bridges, we're not going back and forth over them. And I was giving a similar reflective talk. Uh, True North is part of Pico, California, mm -hmm. and, and we're part of Faith in Action nationally, 
and they asked me um, to to attend a pre-pandemic um, have have a Native American perspective on my movement in the world, and I talked about being an animal and that we um, we forget that we are um, that that humans are just part of the people of the planet. We're not the deer people. We're not mm. the bear grass people. We're not the salmon people. We share this place, That's right. and. And there is an instinct as an animal for survival that we all have to look at and we all have to have, and we can't forget that. But we also have to be able to reach out and reach across, and any woman in this room, any person of color in this room can look around the room and know who might be their friend and who might not be their friend. And there is an instinct there that you have to be confident enough in yourself to be able to move, move towards someone. And as I got through with my talk, and I stepped down, stepped down from the podium, and I was going back to my seat, there was a big black guy there that I'd never met before. And he was smiling at me as I walked by him. And it just so happened he was sitting in front of me. So I decided to risk, and I just kind of leaned over and hugged, gave him a big bear hug from behind. I didn't know if he was going to throw me back over the <laughs> side or what. I'd never met him. And turns out he's from Detroit, and he said, he said, I love you, brother. And I said, that's what your smile said to me. I just thought I'd take a risk. I, that, that, that sometimes we just have to feel it, and, right. we, and we have to lean into it. That's right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, what reflections do you have for those who want to build affirming, welcoming, liberating environments for learning and development? This is our closing thoughts. I'm just going to take the opportunity to say, because you know I'm echoing, um, you know, our uh, very aspirational, amazing English learner policy here in California. But we um, actually, um, Californians together, and the um, a California Association for Bilingual Education are co-sponsoring two bills. And these two bills are, you know, to really uh, fully implement um, the EL roadmap in California. And so one of them, AB 2074, um, is to develop a statewide implementation plan, you know, that uh, will be housed at CDE and will be staffed uh, with state um, funds um, because right now um, all English learner um, staff uh, at CDE are paid for through federal, federal funds, and so there are no state funds that are dedicated um, to, um, you know, moving forward <coughs> initiatives uh, from CDE. And so um, we have that bill, and we also have another bill, AB 2071, that would provide incentive grants uh, to districts uh, to deeply implement the a roadmap to become a bright spot to, con, um, to engage in a community of practice as they work towards you know, creating these welcoming, affirming, and liberating environments for learning. Um, and also for the development of a parent toolkit for the implementation of the English Learner Roadmap. So right now, it's in the Assembly Appropriations Committee, and we're really <laughs> working <laughs> hard to pass that um, you know, with the vision that you know, it's going to be a reality. And of course, it would include um, culturally responsive, sustaining, you know, pedagogy and curriculum for all students, right? So that um, students learn to be respectful of each other, um, and um, and we affirm all students' identities in our uh, California schools. So I wanted Great. to take that opportunity. Thank you. Others, what are your reflections? What can people do? I think for, for us, it, it really is continuing to invest in our own community, continuing to invest in our own children and families. Uh, we've been around for 50 years, and we're fortunate enough to actually, in our board, actually have an uh, a actual child when they were three, four, and five-year-olds actually on our board of directors, right? So this idea about uh, it, it really only happens if we make it happen. And that the, the forces are, are great, but can be done if we continue to strengthen that, that sort of element and source of, of the strength of the community. And so that's what I would offer as ways to think about it. Yeah. Thank you. So what was the prompt again? But the, this is what I want to close <laughs> what with. What should people, I, I turned the page. What, should, um, what are your final reflections on how folks can help yeah, I, um, develop 
Amen. Man, we're Come on, on a journey, y'all. I mean, yeah. you know, we're learning and unlearning. Yeah. And if you have the audacity to put um, young people above you, then just act with grace and humility to be a student of the student. Mm -hmm. To act with grace and humility to know that someone loves that child and you're gonna take the time to get a sense of that, that child's family, their network, so you can access their capital, uh, their genius, so that student can go farther faster, helping that young person understand who and whose they are. But we can't do that if, if, if we aren't doing the mirror window work. <laughs> Uh, Sean Jen writes uh, the four pivots. Um, yeah, we haven't we haven't manifested greatness in this country yet, uh, and the only thing stopping us is us. So you know, we just got to build, will, and organize. Um, and I have all the faith and in, agitate, uh, yeah, and build the capacity, <laughs> and uh, and we hold that faith. Um, yeah, I think all things are possible. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Thank you, Terry. Did you have a last word? True North wants to build authentic relationships with young people and I just want to expand on the belong circle training um, that we're, um, uh, we're testing, we're figuring out, we're putting together um, because I really think that that's uh, the key to so much of this is, is if we create safe places for young people and their families and educators who care about kids to, to come together and talk about the hard stuff, the mm -hmm. hard stuff that's out there then I heard it earlier today, it doesn't matter what other states are doing to limit children and to limit knowledge and to limit inclusion, but California leads and that's, that's, that's where we need to be leading. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, let's give a round of applause for these amazing people.